telling some of the folks, maybe for the Zoom folks as well, that tomorrow Kelly is going to send everybody an email with two attachments, and um, it's it's one of them that's going to be um, this extensive list of native plants that that we refer everybody to. The other um, uh, document is actually going to be a copy of these um, slides of the presentation, so you don't have to take down every little detail because you'll be able to uh, to download this uh, tomorrow. Um, I'm a master gardener. That doesn't that doesn't mean I, I'm a master know-it-all, but um, what, what we do is that we, um, we, we know where to, if I, can, if I don't know the answer, I know where to find it. So that's what the master gardening is all, is all about, is actually providing information and where to go to for additional information. So let's get started. So now will the arrows work or do I? Okay. All right. So the, the big thing that we're talking about native plants is particularly because of the, we were talking about this before we started, is that really the, the, our native wildlife really depends on the plants that they grew up with and that they're used to. And so that's what native plants are all about. It's plants that have learned how to adapt to our particular environment. Um, we've got some plants that really know what to do if it's too dry. We know we have some plants to know what to do if it's if it's really wet. Um, if you need if they need sun, if they need shade, so they've really adapted to our particular climate, and that's what native plants are all about. And if we have a native plant, they have because of this adjustment that they have been able to to make. We actually would need um, less pesticides, um, less water. Uh, and it's just more of, of an eco-friendly uh, uh, environment. So, so that's what this is about. Um, it's really, the, our native plants are really uh, part of uh, our, our uh, ecological framework that we have here. Most of them are non-invasive. Invasive means that they would really come in and they would kind of take over and they push other plants out of the way. But so that's why the non-native plants if they come into our area, they can become invasive because they really like what's going on, but they don't have any natural enemies here. And so there's nothing to control them. And so that's why non-native plants can be more invasive. There are some natives that are aggressive, but you kind of know that, and there's ways to control them. And uh, as we said, there's really so many different, the, the natives have adapted to all of the conditions that you can imagine in anybody's garden. And that, that's the caveat, it's the right place for the right plant. So you need to know how much, you know, you look at your garden and you look at the places that have, you know, you look at how much sun does this area get? How much water does this area get? Um, how much uh, uh, over uh, foliage is there? So that's why you really have to take a look at your garden and, and assess, you know, what kind of plants you can use. And also the uh, one of the besides invasive plants, we also can have invasive insects that have come into the area, and that's why um, hemlock and the emerald um, ash and the oaks are not on this list because they have become just really devastated. And people with the ash uh, uh, bore, you know, the, in some places, you know, that people have just had to take out, you know, like twenty ash trees and things. So it's really devastated. Um, these these three large trees, and so we don't really recommend that you um, get these because this invasive insect came in probably on some non-native plants. Some plants were brought in or something. Um, the um, the big thing right now is the um, spotter and lantern fly. Does that does everybody know about that? That was brought into um, Pennsylvania in the Philadelphia area, and it's creeping up here. And it's, it's actually a beautiful insect. I mean, if you look at it, it's, it's actually beautiful. But unfortunately, there, there are no, because it's an, a, a non-native uh, insect, we don't have any controls for it. And it really hits the um, grapes and um, wheat and things like that really hard. So, it, so, it's, so it's, creeping, it's creeping up. So everybody is supposed to be on the lookout. If you don't really know what it looks like, you should Google it. It's very easy to find so that you would be able to spot it. 
does it go after trees? Does it sell out of it? No, it doesn't go after the it it um it actually um um does their lar larval stage on a on a tree and it's actually a specific tree it's the tree of heaven which is kind of a shrubby tree uh and and it, you have to really learn how to how to find that tree also so if you so google it and really kind of because everybody and if you see it there's really a national um reporting center because it's 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 that terrible because modern lanternfly spotted lanternfly The tree of heaven. Yeah. It's kind of that's kind of a shrubby tree, but it can grow tall. Yeah. It's a non-native, it's a non-native tree. Um the other thing about of using native plants is that it's really um perfection is not the goal because if you're doing if you're doing native and eco-friendly gardening, you want to use as few pesticides and things as you, as you can. So um, a few bugs, you have to be able to tolerate a few bugs is the saying. So, you know, you have to, uh, you have to allow your, yourself to feel comfortable with just a few little holes in your leaves and, and things like that. Another thing that we're gonna talk about are the different, the many different types of, of plants that you can use. And so if you really, if you don't plan a whole a bunch of one particular plant, um, that might be devastated by something, um, you know, to get around that, you, you know, you're going to plant a diversity of plants. You're going to plant some of this, some of this, some of this, that actually um, wouldn't, one bug is not going to really like all of the difference because the, the bugs have done, done the same thing. They have kind of specialized uh, on plants. So that's, that's why um, a few bug holes are, you, you have to learn how to tolerate that because <laughs> we are not having. Uh, so uh, I, Yeah, right. Because there, there are some right. There are some native plants that um, you just the the deer. You just I, I have lots of deer, so I just have to. I I try this or that. I particularly try deer. Um, what what might be kind of deer resistant, but of course, if the deer are hungry enough, they're going to eat anything. So um, that's the story with deer. You're just not going to. Um, and, and apparently, you have to have a nine foot fence if you want to really keep them out. But um, anyway, so I don't really like the fence idea. So I just kind of <gasps> keep trying. <laughs> okay, so, so what, is, what is an actual native plant? And, and that's actually uh, a, a plant. Well, the really tough uh, definition is that it was here, uh, it's been here forever. So uh, it, it is not it's in particular, uh, it, it, so that it can actually vary. Our group of native plants will differ from uh, another area, even even close by. So um, native plants really go down. They're very specific. Actually, uh, one of the um, uh, the uh, websites I'm going to talk about actually has um, has it broken down by county within New York State. But then it goes by state, and then it goes by region. So um, uh, the the native plants really ha have been in this region forever. Um, and then this is, um, uh, we are, we are um, zone six. This is um, something that, um, that you're gonna have to be, be well, I'm sure you're probably all familiar with it. As we go through the talk and we, we see the, the different conditions, we talk about the different conditions and things. This information you can usually get on a plant tag. So when a plant tag, it usually tells you uh, if it's a perennial, if it's, a, if it's, um, if it's an annual, um, what kind of light it needs, what kind of water it needs, how big it gets. Um, and the zone, because if you expect a perennial, if you plant a perennial, perennial comes back every year. So if you want something that comes back every year, you have to make sure that it's viable in our zone. And the bigger the numbers, the warmer it gets. So if you go down into um, Maryland and Virginia, then you start getting into seven, eight, nine as you as you go down. So we are six. Actually, it's, it, we're warming up. Things are warming up. Well, I'm not sure about here, but I know I, I moved from uh, Northern Virginia, and um, we we actually our our level actually went up a little bit too. So you can you can take it um, you know you can take it lower. Um, so so you could you know find something 
I don't know if, we, if, if you would find anything that goes below zone four or not, but so like, you know, maybe you're looking at things for um, four, four through six or really six things. People, if, if I say, don't try going to six feet. Right. You might have little pockets uh, in, your, in your gardens also. You might have a little pocket that's really protected that maybe um, uh, the wind doesn't get to it or, you know, it's just really protected. So you might be able to do, you know, something special there, you know, if you wanted to try something that was good for zone seven or something like that. But really, um, you know, you have to think about the winters. The, the winters is the whole deal. You know, the amount of wind and the, and the temperatures that a plant will um, withstand. And then we, we actually, um, can uh, look at things. We're pretty close to uh, Pennsylvania as well, so so our our, our thing is kind of intermixed. You could go down. To, well, you could be down to Pennsylvania and probably buy plants that would would do fine here. Um, so so the varieties of uh, native plants um, really um, there's some some terms that we need. There's a there's a variety which is the the natural the natural one the one that. Um, as found in nature. And that's important because especially if you collect seeds and things to, to grow additional plants, it's gonna, it's gonna grow true to um, what you expect because it's, an, it's a native seed. If you bought a hybrid or something like that, which is kind of two, two different plants um, mixed together to make a new plant, if you tried to um, grow those seeds, it probably would not grow, grow true to the plant that you bought. So, um, uh, so that's uh, about the, uh, the seeds. Um, and the, these are, uh, you know, just some, there's, there's a common name and then there's a scientific name. And depending on um, which way you prefer to refer to things, um, the common names are, the scientific name really tells what the plant is. Common names can vary by region. That's, that's why common names are not, um, you know, the number one uh, identifier, as you can see from, from these. Uh, from these scientific names. And then um, cultivars are um, um, high, some, some of them are hybrid and hybrid is not going to be a native plant. Um, some, some native bars are. So it's really, you, you're not going to find that out from the information on a, on a tag, I don't think. So, so you're just really going to have to go with you know, our, a, a list of plants and really try, try to go from there. Um, so, you know, the hybrid, it's, it's mixing two different, they, they take what they like between this, this plant and this plant, and some, somehow they grow them, uh, in, into a, a single plant. And then, uh, well, the native ours are selectively bred from, from a natural plant. So some of those actually work also, but it gets kind of confusing. So, um, and then, uh, hybrids are really, uh, uh, designed for what what people like, and this is an interesting picture because the um, the echinacea on 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 the left is is a true native, and you can actually see the bee on there. Um, and then the um, the next one is actually a, a hybrid because you see it's got the e times um, uh, hydrobia or something, or other. and so so that is um, that's a hybrid, but um, John, who um, put this presentation together, who has a really um, good pollinator garden, he says he's had some luck with that, um, of getting the pollinators to, to go to this particular plant. But the two on the, um, on the, on the right are, um, are unusual um, plants. And so if you, if you really get tired, you know, they, they think that people would like, these are, these are bred for people, not plants, or not animals and, and cultivars and, uh, because, Right, 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 and different colors and things, and so you know they they the two on the right must must not have the um the correct scent. Um, don't really know how much nectar they would have. Um, but people somehow, I don't think it's a big improvement. But um, <laughs> to each to each his own. Um. And and that's that's why the uh, the selective um, breeding is is done. And um, uh, but the, but the real key thing that we just keep going back to is that the pollinators, the bees, and the hummingbirds, 
and uh, the ants and other things that pollinate, and then the other things that depend on berries, the birds, the birds in our area uh, that depend on the on fruit, fruited things and seeds. Um, and then some of our other um, friendly animals, like, you know, the deer were her first, that's everybody, you know, says that. So, you know, they like the acorns and, you know, if they would just kind of keep to the acorns, it'd be good, but they, they don't do that. So, um, and rabbits and uh, groundhogs are becoming quite an issue too. Does anybody have one living, living in their garden? Yeah, so. Um, and if you and if you really want to get rid of one, you have to because um, I I was I had something I didn't really know what it was, and so I was looking it up and I was supposed to call an expert um, trapper so that they would come and because you can't trap the thing and take it out and put it someplace else you're not supposed to do that. So, um, but I had my neighbor do it anyway. So uh, anyway, so. Uh, yeah, so, so there, there really are some, you know, animals besides the deer that do the damage, but then, you know, they, they also um, need things. And so we also have to provide habitat and food for um, even some of the animals that we don't especially like. And of course, the pollinator thing is with the, um, the, the bees, the native bees have, um, I don't know, you've probably all, all read about it for several years now. There's some, some kind of um, disease that's going around and just decimating um, beehives. And so that's, you know, that's particularly um, stressful for fruit farmers and, and things that really need um, the pollination to produce the fruit. So um, we're, we're trying to get a handle on that too by, by going back to the native, native things and provide a good habitat and maybe attract more um, bees and pollinators and, and that. Okay, native ours is really just, um, you know, as I said, cr crossing things, um, and and you can get some in, get some interesting things, and some of them are good for pollinators and that. So somebody was um, asking beforehand about if you know we were going to talk about garden design or something or other. So we do have some few basic things about about what a good garden would look like if. Um, from our point of view and also from an animal's point of view. So they're saying, if you take a bird's eye view of a garden, what they would, what they would like to see are some big trees that the birds and things can um, provide shelter, shelter um, nesting areas. Um, then you would have some bushes, some large bushes and things that would provide shelter, uh, more food. Uh, and then you would have the, the uh, plants, the perennials. And so that's kind of the basic garden design that, that you're going to be going for. And the plants that you put in these areas is, is really um, uh, uh, depends on, on what kind of uh, uh, garden you have. And it's actually now the, um, it's become kind of a suggestion that instead of doing our, our fall um, garden cleanup, that you actually do it in the spring so that you leave some of the debris there so that that provides a, um, a, a shelter for, for some of the animals and insects and things. And it also um, might, keep, might keep the weeds down so, so that, and it also provides some winter interest if you have like sedum and things, um, you know, provides some, some winter uh, interest if you leave the seed heads as long as possible um, so that the birds can um, uh, enjoy the seeds all winter long. Um, they, um, there, there are, um, I was reading about bees the other day and there are a zillion different kinds of bees. So they're not talking about yellow jackets or things like that. Um, it, it's, it's really just a type of bee that lives in the ground, ground bees. So they're beneficial. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you would, you know, you wouldn't want to do this, you know, right next to your back door or something, but if you know, you've got a, a garden big enough, you know, you might leave some areas um, uh, you know, out farther, farther, farther away from, from where you are, you know, for this, this um, um, patch for uh, bare ground for the digger bees. Are there some bees that are not beneficial? Um, yeah, I don't think the yellow jacket is good for anything. Um, and there are, um, and they're, they're actually, yeah. And um, Aren't there some other things that have come in that are just absolutely horrible? Um, yeah. So I don't. I didn't even know if they're good pollinators and things, but yeah. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. You never, you, I mean, they have to eat something. And so if some of them are carnivorous or, or things, you know, they, they, they really might help with um, other things. And then this is the, uh, the plant um, selection thing for your design. As we were talking about, um, you're, you're going to um, plant according to what you have. And when a good garden basic is that if you were planting um, perennials and things like that, that you plant in an odd number, um, if, it's really a, if it's really a large plant, if you kind of consider it a specimen plant, you, would plant, you could plant one, especially if it's a bush or something like that. But if it's a smaller perennial, uh, you know, a, a, um, something that would be growing, you know, not, not over five, four feet, I would say, three or four feet, you want to plant in odd numbers. So you'd plant three, five, seven, so that you really want to produce a clump big enough that it is going to attract the pollinators because you, you want to avoid the, um, you know, the crazy quilt thing, you know, that you got one plant, one of these, and then you got one of those and one of those and one of those, and it's really not, not going to be very helpful for attracting um, all the beneficial um, things that you want. And it's also, um, well, depends on, on what your um, aesthetically pleasing means to you, but you know, typically a group of flowers is, um, gives, you know, more of an idea of what the plant is all about if you, if you have several. And then the other thing is, well, we're gonna go through this and it's, it's really um, talking about uh, some, some of the plants for the particular areas. So the first thing that we, we talked about, if you had a bird's eye view, you would really want some large deciduous trees for the, um, for the birds and the other things um, to have uh, protection, even uh, moths and things. Um, uh, our, our hosts uh, in uh, some of the plants. So, so these are some things, um, these deciduous trees, that means the leaves fall in the winter, um, but, and they're really big trees. And of course they take years to grow. So um, if you don't have any, if you have the space, you wanna be sure that you don't put it very near your house because you wanna always go planting things. You always go from the um, uh, end, end size, the full, full grown size. So that's, that's what you, one of the things that, a big mistake that people make is just putting them too close to a house um, because the roots can grow into your foundation. They can, you know, sc um, scrape your roof, all kinds of things. So, you know, you could, if you don't have any big trees and if you have the space, you might consider planting some for future generations. You know, in 80 and 60, 50 years, you know, the, plant, the tree will be great, even though we might not be here to see it. But anyway, um, so then uh, these, uh, this this is a particularly pretty um, tree. Uh, at, at, that is a shag, shag bark hickory. It's got a really um, beautiful um, uh, bark. And that's why you can pick out trees that really have kind of some interest that, that you like. Some trees have really pretty um, uh, bark. Uh, the the uh, thing on the, um, the tree on the bottom is actually a tulip poplar flower. It's really pretty. And that really uh, brings in the bees and things. Just, just love that. And it's really a pretty flower. Um, from the tulip poplar tree. And here, here are some other examples of native um, large trees that we could, um, well, well, some of the, um, the, the oaks, uh, you, you might wanna hold off on, on that because the, um, the oak wilt is still around and there's, there's no, um, no way to combat it. We don't know anything that will impact it. Um, a sassafras tree is, is kind of pretty, um, and these things are called um, host plants. And what a host plant is, is that a um, butterfly will um, select specific trees and things. It will lay its eggs and then their larvae will eat um, whatever tree that it is on. And they're very, very specific. I mean, it's down to a single um, uh, butterfly or moth or something to a specific tree. So that's what a host is. And then um, conifers, are, of course, are, um, have needles. And um, th these are some of our native uh, conifers that, that, again, some of them have some berries that um, uh, larger animals would like. Um, and they would, that, they would also provide good uh, nesting sites and shelter. Uh, so, so these are some of the popular uh, big uh, conifers for our area. And then some of the smaller. So then we've got the big, the big layer. And then the next layer down would be some smaller trees and, and shrubs. And these are some, um, and these, these are all on the list. And then, as I said, you're gonna be getting 
uh, a copy of all of this. So you, you can just kind of keep in mind something that you maybe want, want to look at later. And I imagine that there's gonna be a lot of things that we've never um, talked about before, but that's what native plants are all about. It's really getting down into some things that, um, that have maybe lost favor. And, but now we're, we're trying to get, get back uh, to where we started from. Service, service berry is one of them and it's really got pretty flowers. Uh, and it's, um, it's um, got berries and so, and it's a host plant for a specific butterfly that goes and lays its eggs, but also uh, produces berries that, that the, um, the birds like. And then the, the choke berry has, is, uh, has, a, has a pretty berry. It's also um, hosting. And then dogwoods are, uh, there are many different kinds of dogwoods and um, they're, they're, that's one of the, the trees that really does well around here. And the, the common dog, there's many different kinds of dogwoods that, that are native. The flowering dog one is the one that we always think of. And uh, the pink dogwood would probably would, would be non-native because it, you know, it's, it's the flowering one is, is white. Um, a pagoda um, dogwood is, is another um, type, type of dogwood. It's really kind of um, bushy and it has a pretty um, flower. So um, it's, it's really fun just to start looking these things up because I was doing that as I was preparing for this. I was because some of these things I wasn't familiar with either. So I just started looking through them and the pagoda dogwood flower looks nothing like um, the flowering dogwood flower. So again, it's part, it's part of the dogwood family, but it's, um, it has a, uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a different um, uh, member of um, the dogwood family. And the Redozier, um dogwood is um, actually, um, that's the red, red, have you heard of the red twig dogwood? Um, the, the, uh, that has winter interest so that, um, do you have one? Yeah, and so that has particular winter interest because the the um, the twigs that are left are really a bright red, and that has a totally different flower from what you might think of, uh, and it also tolerates um, wet soils. And here are some other smaller things that that we kind of know about. I think we're all um, um, familiar with hydrangeas. There's there's all kinds of different hydrangeas now. And a native is this the, the smooth uh, lace cap. Uh, spice bush is, is another um, plant that really has an interesting um, flower. Uh, most most of and these are going to uh, flower and thing in in the spring because uh, we're, we'll be going through some plants that, that uh, will be flowering throughout the summer. But most of the trees and shrubs um, flower in the spring because they really are going to have to after they flower, they have to start creating berries or seeds or, or um, nuts or something. So that's why everything kind of blooms in the spring. Uh, nine bark on the bottom is um, a, a, um, a native that is recommended for lots of, Barbary is uh, been very popular in the past and Barbary is actually not, it's early invasive. And so this is, nine bark is a recommended uh, replacement if you can start taking taking out your, your barberries and, uh, and also burning bush. Burning bush is also an invasive plant. So um, nine bark has, um, has really um, nice foliage in the fall. So that's a good substitute for some non-native plants. And here, uh, pussy willow is, I think it's kind of an old fashioned plant um, because you don't really see much, but, but it really takes a lot of water. So, um, but, it, but it is native. And if you have a really moist uh, area, uh, viburnums are also very pretty. They they come in in different um, sh um, shades, and they're they're actually uh, uh, a very nice plant. Some of them have very nice scents also, and there, there's uh, really really um, several that are that are named as that, that um, really the the um, and they have nice shapes too. You can you can really shape you can keep um, viburnums in a nice shape. Some of the um, bushes and things really get kind of gangly, and they're a little bit harder to shape. But viburnums are very nice. Um, in that they, that you can shape them. Then now we're getting into some perennial flowers, and they're divided um, by um, when when they um, when they flower. And the early so the early period is from um, is, uh, after the first frost up to mid June, and the mid mid flowering ones are from mid June to mid August, and then the late flowerings are from mid August up through uh, a freeze. And um, columbines is something that th those are, you can do, I've seen those in, 
in gardens, and I have a few. They're not quite as, as hard to grow as some of the others um, that really bloom in, in the spring, the, um, the early ones. And these are for sun, so they're going to be divided up by time and by sun or shade. So, um, and this is for, for, for the design part. This is where you, you really start dividing, selecting your plants by your garden. I don't. I don't have a problem with with um, with that with my deer. That um, yeah, the crane the uh, the cranes build that is um, a, makes a very nice ground cover. And what a ground cover means is it's going to spread by itself. It's going to cover the ground. It's going to help you uh, keep your soil moist. It's going to help you keep uh, the weeds down, so that you really um, can use um, uh, and and it's going to cut down on how much mulch you're going to need eventually. Because if you can keep your ground covered uh, in between, if you had some taller plants. And then you have the ground cover around. This makes a very pretty ground cover. And then here are some other early ones that we probably know about um, the, um, the creeping flocks. That's another great um, ground cover. And um, it attracts them. Um, and so the, the, the thing about early is that the uh, pot, has everybody seen a uh, hummingbird already this year? Yeah, I thought just saw one the other day. So you know the uh, the bees are waking up, and you know the other the pollinators and other things are coming, so they want nectar, and um, so that's that's the reason to have some early blooming uh, perennials in your garden. And there's lots to choose from, um, uh, and again, some of these plants weren't even familiar with me, so to me. Um, so, but there's, there's just so much to, uh, to choose from and uh, different, different types of flowers. So, um, you know, you can just kind of pick which ones mean something to you. Um, then moving into um, some uh, flowers, uh, some plants that bloom uh, in the mid part uh, for sun. Um, th this is the, um, uh, in particular, talking about the milkweed. And these are all the specimens of um, uh, all the varieties of milkweed um, that you can use it because the common will, will, common uh, milkweed is is really very um, invasive if if you really let it go because you know when when the the seed pod puffs open and the, the little each one of those things that flies out is a seed so it's it's really hard to control um, but so you don't have to have that common milkweed you can use um, butterfly weed. And there's a purple milkweed and um, swamp milkweed. If you have some some wet areas, there's really some plants that, that you can put in that area as well. Awesome. These are some other interesting um, uh, native per perennials. Joe pie, Joe pie weed is is, um, is is a nice plant. That's what this. But they, they get quite tall. So when you're um, when you're planting your planting, uh, you're going to want to be sure that you put the tall plants in the back. Um, because this this can get like seven feet tall and things like that. A lot of the native plants get very tall. So so that's a particular thing that you need to pay attention to is how tall are they going to get? Because the, the tall plants you're going to plant in the back back of of your um, of your garden area. Then in, next to them, then you would plant something um, that maybe is four feet tall. And then in the front, you would plant your low plants and your your um, ground covers and things like that. So how tall a plant gets is really important because if you plant a tall one in front, it's going to shade out uh, what's behind it. Plus, you won't be able to see what's behind there. So um, I'm sure we've all made those mistakes. I have <laughs> so, had to move them. Um, so, some other uh, un unusual um, perennials, um, uh, the the pearling everlasting, I, I wasn't really familiar with that one. Um, bee, bee balm is quite um, common. That's the, the flower here. And bee balm can, can be, um, uh, mildew can be a problem with bee balm. And the way you get, the one thing that you can try to, to keep the mildew down is that you would um, try to keep the leaves, leaves dry when you're watering. You would water, try to water at ground level, um, water early in the morning um, so that the leaves don't get wet. So, because if you water in the afternoon, you water the leaves um, overnight, you know, the temperature drops, the leaves are wet, and that's kind of what causes the mildew. And it doesn't really harm with, um, with bee balm, the uh, mildew doesn't really harm them. I mean, you know, they just don't look very nice, and, but they come back the next year. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to do that much harm. That, that one, I'm, I'm not really sure. That, um, that um, I think, is actually listed as an herb. And, it, and it's, um, 
it, it's, it's kind of pretty. Um, it's an unusual plant. The hummingbirds, it's got a, it's really got a kind of a nice flower. Um, so, so if you're look, looking for something unusual, um, maybe you want to, maybe you want to look that one up. It doesn't get all that tall, so. But it says it's a monarda, which is bee So is it the same as bee bomb? Well, the thing, the thing is that that's, um, you know, the same thing with the dog woods. You know, they're they're of the same family, but yet they're so very different. Um, and so that, that so that's why. Um, That's bebon. That's the regular bebon. Oh, okay. And with the with the other one, it's you know, it's a it's a type of bebon, but it okay. it has different colors. So if you were looking for some different colors, if you didn't like the red, um, and I, I think there there actually are some nat native native of uh, bebon that are different colors now too. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if you're if, the nice thing about this too is these, there's some really interesting flowers in here. If you're not really familiar with them, you know, do, do some research. You know, you just Google them and you're going to find all kinds of nice pictures and it tells you everything you wanted to know about the plant. Um, and here's um, the cardinal flower is in the middle. That's the, the red one that, that takes moisture. Um, but again, the um, the, the pollinators and everybody love that plant, but it, then it takes moist soil. Um, the uh, the one on the, the the upper right, that's the um, the lobelia, and that that's really got kind of an interesting flower. Um, yeah, it's yeah, quote. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it it does it does it gets probably like like this tall, three or four feet, okay. three feet, and um, the the culvers. Um, root. Um, I, I don't really know that one, but it's got, it looks like it's got a very interesting um, flower. So, um, you know, again, you know, here, you, you know, depending on what you like, if you want to start bringing some variety into your, to your garden, I mean, that's, that's really kind of an attractive plant. But again, it gets tall, so you're going to want to put it in the back and it needs moist soil. A lot of these need moist soil, which, which um, I, I have a problem with because I, I don't really have any moist areas. When, when I moved here, I thought I wasn't going to have to water as much as where I was before, but I was mistaken. And um, so anyway, it's, it's not as, it's not as con consistently um, moist here. Um, so, you, so you do have to end up watering if you pick plants that require some moisture and you don't have a na naturally moist area. And here, here are some, some other interesting um, plants. Um, the mountain mint, um, again, that, well, it has a long bloom time and that's um, hopefully deer resistant. You could try it. Um, um, the bottom one is, is kind of interesting because I was looking at, Brecky, the coneflower is something I can grow. Deer do not eat, so I have lots of that. Uh, but the native, this is the native coneflower and uh, it gets very tall. It says it gets like seven feet tall or something or other. And it's, and it's very, and it's very um, uh, gangly and, and everything. And so, uh, you know, if you have winds and things like that, a lot of these tall plants, you know, they end up flopping over and all that. I particularly don't, don't like that. So I, I don't have a whole lot of tall plants. Um, uh, I was told that there are perennial sunflowers. Would that almost be considered a perennial sunflower? No, no. And there's there's another um, we're going to come to it um, uh, in some of the succeeding um, uh, flowers that is actually uh, a native our cone flower which is the which is the typical cone flower but we'll get that and that's what I have and um, goldenrod is now we're now we're into the late um, flowering season it's always nice this is from mid you know in mid August comes everything is hot and everything and everything the blooms have all gone so you can really kind of concentrate. And start looking for some specific plants that just flower at from mid August to to the first freeze. And goldenrod is is one of them. And uh, it, this is not what causes the allergies and everything. That's ragweed. So, so forget about that. So anyway, goldenrod is really pretty. I I had um yeah it's 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 really and that gets that can get tall, um. Uh, and and it can tolerate dry soil and things. And there are um several um. 
uh, types of it too. So, um, and, and they're gonna, they're gonna vary in color by which one you get, but, the, but they're all native. So you don't have to have just the standard yellow uh, goldenrod. Um, the, another late um, flowering group of plants for, for sun are the asters. And, and these are really very pretty. I, I had some, some of these, I didn't really have too many fall flowering things, but my asters came up and they just stayed in bloom for, um, for weeks. Um, so, so they're, they're very nice to in, include in your, your garden. And there are several, um, several different um, native R's that, that you can get, you know, they're not all the plain blue, I think is, is the, uh, uh, the purplish blue, I think is the most common one, but there are, but there are different colored ones. Here's some, here's some other interesting plants that are for sun. And the turtle head is called the turtle head because that's kind of the way the flower looks. It's an interesting flower. It stays quite small. Um, and the, again, so a lot of these prefer moist soil. So you're gonna have to really look at that as, as you're thinking about what to plant. And the, uh, the bottle jensen is, is another interesting plant that you don't see too often, but uh, it's, uh, the, the bumblebees like that because apparently they, can, they need to pry open the flower and the bumblebee is big enough that they can pry, pry open the flower. But it, it's really very pretty. They come in a little cluster and-, and it's, um, No, the sun, they- Yeah, they're supposed to both sun. They, some of them might do part part shade, but and here here are some other ones that the um, sneeze weed and that's it's not because it makes you sneeze, but it says it was uh, actually can be used as snuff. If, I guess if you if you run out of regular snuff, I don't know what that is, but you can uh, you can do that. So anyway, that's kind of an unusual flower, but it's pretty and it's going to bloom. It's going to bloom in the fall. And the same thing with the uh, the ironweed um, is, is another uh, uh, fa fairly pretty plant. So there's several things that you can get and really have some fall flowers. And these are for sun. Then to switch over to um, shade, these are you know going to be a whole whole different set of plants that really do not like the sun that like the shade. And a lot of them are some of them are going to be non-flowering because um, you you might be using those more for their foliage because um, the, you know, they don't need the sun uh, to create the flowers. And um, uh, this is, uh, this, this is uh, John, uh, John said that this, this is um, his slide because he has, he does not only have uh, shade, he doesn't only have dry shade, he has very dry shade. And that's caused by um, big, uh, a stand of big um, um, trees, that take, take all the moisture, the roots, the really the big trees. You, you often have trouble planting things under a tree because the, the, the roots, the tree itself is taking all the moisture and, and the nutrients. So it's pretty hard to, to grow around some trees. And there's actually some shade that it's really um, pretty difficult. Um, so, um, but he says he, he keeps trying though, or as opposed to normal, normal shade, uh, which uh, would typically be on the north side of your house. So if you're look, typically, if you're looking at how much sun you get, um, the east and, and the west are called, are usually part shade because part shade is four to six hours a day of sun. Um, the southern exposure would be full sun, that's six to eight hours a day. And then the north would be probably, you know, a shade area if you, if you really don't get much sun on the, on the north side of your house. And if you have average moisture, um, you, you can grow some things in shade. Um, and then here, here are some, um, the banberry has um, this, um, some, some interesting seeds. And this is the false Solomon seal on the bottom in the white flower, um, the flower in the, in the spring. And then it has these pretty berries in the fall. And there's, there's a false Solomon seal and there's a real Solomon seal. Does everybody know the difference? Okay. so. So this, the fault Solomon seal, the flower comes out of the end and it's really kind of frilly. Um, and then the uh, real Solomon seal is the, the picture on the bottom. And that's where um, these um, beautiful little white things go, go, up, go up the edge. So they're both part, uh, but they're totally different families. So I don't know why they have the Solomon seal as part of their um, name, but anyway. Um, Jake, Jacob's ladder is um, something else that, that actually will flower uh, in the shade and um, it has a really pretty um, 
delicate um, uh, leaf leaf to it. Um, but it can, if it gets um, if it gets too dry and if it gets too much light, then it's probably going to go dormant in the summer. And that means it dies down and you think, oh my gosh, I killed it or something. But then next spring, it's going to come back up. And those are called ephemerals, actually. There are several spring plants that are ephemerals that they die after they flower, they die down because it gets um, too much sun uh, for them. So they die down and then they, but next spring, they come back up and, and you really haven't, you haven't killed anything. We're coming back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here, here's another. Um, th this is, I, I it's, this is the the typical some of the typical things that that you see in a, on a wildflower uh, hike in the woods and things in the spring. It's really kind of unusual to see them in a garden. I would think unless you really have that you know that nice moist, um, humusy um, you know place for it to to grow in. It's called blood root because if you if you break the stem off, it actually really has a red sap that comes out. And then the um, tiarella on the bottom, the foam flower, that, that's that's a more typical plant that we can see in gardens. And it really has kind of an attractive leaf. You can see some of the veining and things, and it has kind of a delicate flower. And um, the pollinators like it, and it's kind of pretty. Here's the bug vein. That's another great name. I uh, don't know where some of these names come from, but anyway, I mean that's that's another um, kind of very very attractive flower. That's going to be kind of tall. Uh, and then the uh, the poke milkweed on the bottom is another uh, another type of uh, milkweed that you, that the monarch butterflies will, will like as a host. Um, and uh, John isn't sure if it, if it grows in dry dry shade. He hasn't had much luck with that, but supposedly it's supposed to grow in dry shade. So even if you wanted to try a couple of different um, milkweeds to see if you can attract the monarch butterflies, there's a lot to choose from. And then here, here are some other perennials for the, for the shade, the, um, the woodland um, su sunflower. Um, so that's where you get, you know, th that's not really the, you know, a typical sunflower, but um, you know, that, that's, um, and that, that's gonna be kind of a gangly plant too. Um, but it, it flowers in the fall in the shade. Another nice thing that you can have if you have um, for, for interest, uh, it, it doesn't um, really have, have much animal um, value to them. Um, but I, I really kind of like um, ferns. They really, if you have a nice moist humusy um, area um, in, the, in the shade, there are several different types, lots of different types of ferns. And um, you, you can, Kind of just create your own fern grotto if you even have you know kind of a water feature or something or or other. Um, there are lots of different um, native ferns that we have. Um, hmm. oh, I'm not remembering that. There, there's a uh, there's a there's a northern maidenhair fern and then there's a southern maidenhair fern and so they're totally different plants and so we really have the northern maidenhair. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I have one but I, I don't remember seeing flowers on it. So that you know they have totally different it's, it's kind of um, you, know, you, can, you can kind of test yourself to see if you could actually I even have a fern book and I still can't tell them apart. I mean it's really I mean it's, it's it's supposed to be, you know, the, the way the leaf goes, some of them are pointed, some of them go down like this. And, and it's really, it's kind of fun. Um, you know, just kind of test yourself, see if you can figure out which fern you have. Um, uh, here's, here's another um, plant um, that blooms, that snake, snake wart. It's just kind of an interesting plant. It's got an interesting flower. Um, uh, the, um, the Bowman's root, that's a, um, in the spring, um, but it has nice fl uh, fl flowers. It has nice foliage in the fall, but it's really got kind of a, a delicate flower. So there's lots to choose from. I mean, you just think of kind of the, the old standbys, but you know, you can really kind of go beyond that. Uh, if you, if you know, there, there is another way to get plants though, and it's through mail order. But um, it's, so if you really have your heart set on on one of these. Um, uh, different different plants and you can't find it anymore. You, there are mail order nurseries, but they turn out to be a little more expensive, especially because you usually have to pay shipping and things. And they have to ship them before 
um, the growing, uh, you know, before it gets really hot in summer. So I don't really know how much longer you could actually order from a, a mail order because they won't, they won't ship um, during hot weather because they have to get them from their place to your place before they dry out totally. And then here, here are some, uh, some other things. Uh, the golden goldenrod again. Here, here's a different one. Um, so you see, they're they're not all all the same. So you can get um, several different um, uh, cultivars or uh, of a, of the same um, genus that that you know are going to look totally different, which really might be kind of an interesting thing to do. And then the other thing that that you can use are um, grasses and sedges, which um, uh, typ typically have, um, there's, there's all kinds of them, as we know, they're all different sizes that you can get. So depending on, on what area you have, some of them take um, more moisture than others. Uh, so you'd have to look at that. Um, and that they also have some, some winter interest. You can usually, people typically leave their grasses, especially the taller ones, uh, over winter because they, they retain all of the seeds and things that the, um, the birds and animals and things can, can use during the winter. And then, you know, very early spring, you just cut them, cut them off at the, at the ground and then they, they, they start to sprout up again. And then uh, lawn replacement. So, <laughs> John suggests that we get rid of our grass. I would love to do that, but I have too much grass. Uh, and and the the metal thing that people you know kind of think about oh wouldn't that be great you know just but but it's really pretty hard to do we uh, we also do garden visits and things um, for people that want to ask us questions about their particular gardens and we visited this one fellow that was trying to do the the meadow thing and and unfortunately he and he ended up with um, more weeds in his uh, wildflowers than he did metal flowers. So then it was just kind of a big mess. Um, and so if you, you could really get them going, if you don't mind, you just really have to mow them down. Um, kind of, um, does anybody have a meadow um, garden or anything? We did, and the first year it was great. Second year started getting some weeds in, and as the time went on, it was really Yeah, yeah. But- It looked beautiful, like, yeah. Uh huh. Because it's it's really hard to weed, uh, because you know you got the flowers just all mixed around, um, and and then they really are you you depending on the amount of, of grass that you do have, you you can just to totally turn it into um, uh, you know a native grass area, and there are even sedges um, which are which is really kind of a fancy grass. They're usually smaller. Um, they call them sedges, but but it looks it looks like grass, but they come in different shapes and um, colors and things. If you want to do something other than um, regular grass, the, yeah, these these are the ones that um, they're called carrot. They're in the carex um, family. Um, Where would you see those? Would you see them in a garden uh, store? Yeah, you can buy them. There was a, a picture of, um, I don't know if it's coming up. Um, but then, and then there, there are actually, I, I was, we were talking about that natives could, can actually be pinpointed down to Monroe County uh, and even our state, but there's also some na native perennials that we could actually use from some of our sur surrounding states. Um, but still you have to check into the invasive status I know, for instance, uh, vinca is, is a ground cover that's not invasive here, but it is considered invasive in Pennsylvania. So really it kind of depends on, you know, even though we call it a native, they, they don't. So it, it actually, you know, you're gonna have to still, uh, uh, you, know, you know, kind of look, look at um, what, if it says it's a, if it's a native, is it native to, to what? And is it, and is it appropriate for, for New York State? And these are these are some of the um, things that are not native to um, particularly um, New York, but they but they are uh, ar around us, which which are um, okay. To, uh, they're okay for us to use because they do fine. They're not invasive. Um, the, the blue false indigo is is kind of an interest. That's Baptisia. That's an interesting plant, and I think that's a yeah. And um, the the beard tongue is is an interesting um, plant. 
um, the native bars are available. We, we can use that. Um, Um, it's probably it comes in different colors, and then this is the this is the typical coneflower that um, that you typically see, and that's not native to New York, but it's okay for us to use it. Um, it's totally native in 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 uh, places like Ohio, uh, but you do have to be careful because there are many hybrids. And uh, we we were talking one of the things particular things about um, the, the natives is that we were talking uh, this. This uh, lady saw a, an interesting um, talk recently and it showed um, how much nutrients could be um, in one type of berry as opposed to another type of berry. And so if you have a berry from a non-native plant and it doesn't really have any nutrients in it, the, the birds and things can come and eat this berry and get filled up, but yet it's not getting any nutrients. So that, that's the whole key to the thing is um, even though you have, have a berry, it may, may not be worth anything as far as nutrition goes to um, the native wildlife. Blazing star is another one that's really kind of an interesting plant and that's okay for us to use. Hard to remember all of these things, but as I said, you're gonna, you're gonna get this. And, um, and plus we have this handy list that you can just start carrying around, put it in your car and you know, you're, <laughs> You'll just have it when, when you go uh, shopping. So, yeah. and then of course you always have your phone. You can Google it. So you know if you if you get stuck. Except this is just a little bit easier to use. Um, garden phlox is is another typical flower that I think everybody is kind of used to. That's um, native to to the um, to the eastern um, section. Um, and here here's the regular um, uh, black eyed Susan that um, is, is smaller and it, it's not as big. And um, the, the, uh, the blue sage is the salvia. Um, I, I have a lot of that too. The, the deer really don't like that. So um, I end up with whatever the deer don't eat. So, and, it, and it's really a pretty flower and it blooms for quite a long time. And so our, we were just talking around, oh, not a plain's bad. No, but um, because, you know, you really have, you know, like hostas and, um, uh, azaleas and you know all all the different things that um, you know it's okay to use use them as long as they're not invasive. The invasiveness is is the problem. I think we've probably all seen the pictures of uh, kudzu that they brought in 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 the south. You know, as a as a fast growing uh, uh, ground cover, uh, and, and you know it just decimates the trees and everything. The same thing with the. Um, uh, there, there's two types of wisteria and the, the, the non-native wisteria just grows up the trees and, and everything and it just, you know, kills the trees. So, so that's the problem of, uh, of using non-natives. Is it, is it going to be invasive or not? And is it going to be, as we were talking, is it going to be a good nectar source for pollinators? And of course, annuals, if you want, we all need some color right away in the spring. And so we, we can start putting some out. Hopefully it's supposed to get cold again tonight, but I live up on the lake. And so we're supposed to be in the forties tonight. So um, anyway, soon uh, we, we should, because a, a lot of, uh, of annuals and plants and things really don't like, like to get out there until the, until the soil really um, warms up to at least 65, 70. So, Anyway, spring may be here. Okay, the, these are, um, this is our, um, the resource, this is the, the website for um, us, our, um, the, the Master Gardener site, and this is where uh, you can, um, you can go to get additional uh, information. Uh, we do um, soil samples um, and uh, diagnostic, uh, if you have um, disease or something on your plants, we have a diagnostic lab and we have a helpline. Um, if you call this number, um, it's, it's uh, somebody answers the phone in the morning and if not, then, then you just leave a message and they, and they get back to you. So, so that, that's very helpful too. And that's it, a lot to choose from. That was a lot of information, but um, hopefully it just get, gets you uh, wondering about what's available. Um, if, if you would, if you would 